Okay. Um, Seem to have a few little technical issues getting through that uh, first bit whilst uh, everybody was waiting. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Steve Lewis, and I'm a senior director of RISTEC uh, based here in the UK. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, welcome to this RISTEC webinar, which is the second of uh, our seventh series. Now, we regularly ask you what topics you'd like to cover. And as a result, we'll be presenting on four of the most popular requests. Uh, the subject of today's webinar is uh, an introduction to physical effects modeling. Um, hopefully we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. The webinar will take about an hour uh, with around 45 minutes for the presentation and about 50 minutes for Q&A. Uh, we have muted everybody, so the sound won't be distorted by any background noise. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, and we really do encourage uh, you to do so, then please use the Q&A function. Just hover your mouse down to the bottom of the uh, of the page and the sort of Zoom ribbon pops up. Click on the Q&A, type your question in. Uh, what I'll do is I'll keep track of those questions uh, and we'll cover as many of them as we can at the end of the session within the hour. Okay, I'd now like to briefly introduce RISTEC. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, apologies to our regular participants. You've probably heard this many times before. Uh, I'll be pretty quick. Uh, what we do at RISTEC is we help clients to manage health, safety, security, environmental and business risk, uh, specifically in sectors where the impact of loss is high. Uh, we do that through five business lines. So that's consulting, uh, learning, which includes online and classroom training and and uh, postgraduate education, resourcing, which is about providing associates to actually work at client locations. Uh, we also uh, undertake industrial vendor inspections and assessments. Uh, and we also uh, doing a more and more um, research and development in the field of risk and safety management. Uh, I now like to introduce our presenter today, uh, Abdul Rahman Suka. Um, uh, Abdul Rahman is a principal consultant. Mm -hmm. He's based in our um, offices. Uh, at, it kind of kind of flits between two, actually, between <laughs> in Dubai and also in uh, Saudi. Um, he's got an academic background in chemical engineering, and he's really got uh, an extensive uh, technical and um, process safety and risk assessment experience in the mainly in the oil, gas, and petrochemical industries. Um, it's all a special area, specialist area. Is around uh, leading and executing plant and pipeline uh, quantitative risk assessments, building risk assessments, uh, and a whole variety of other studies, all of which involve uh, physical effects and risk modeling. So hopefully we're in safe, uh, safe hands. Um, there's there's uh, Abdul Rahman's email. If you do want to get in contact with him directly after, after the web webinar, I'm sure he'll be pleased to hear from you. Okay, so over to you, Abdul Rahman. Thanks, Steve. Um, welcome to the webinar. So um, I'm, I've broken down the, um, the content of, of the webinar um, into four uh, sections. Um, the first section, I'll be discussing what physical effects actually are. Um, I'll then proceed to talk about the tools and techniques that are available to us to model physical effects. Um, I'll then talk about the interpreting the physical effects results a little bit and talk about um, mainly human vulnerabilities. And then finally, I'll give you some real life use cases, some, some of my experience using physical effects modeling results. Okay. So the first section of the webinar, what are physical effects? So physical effects always start with the release of a substance. And the physical effects are those effects that can cause serious harm to people environment and assets. So when we talk about release of a substance, we mean a hazardous substance. So substances that are flammable or that are toxic or maybe both. Um, more complex releases, of course, um, are the ones uh, around fluids that are liquid or mixed phase. Um, this is because part of them may vaporize immediately and the rest may um, drop out and form liquid pools on the ground. So many factors influence how a, a substance behaves when it's released. Um, things like 
uh, fluid properties, conditions at containment and atmospheric conditions. So when we talk about physical effects modeling, what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to, to simulate a real life release of a substance. And as part of that, we look at the initial release. So for fluids that are gas or vapor, um, there are generally two types of releases or dispersions that we look at. The first being a continuous release. So this is a release that's generally a little bit more long lasting. So it lasts typically more than a few minutes. Um, and, it's, um, and it's continuously fed from the source until finally it reaches some sort of steady state condition where, uh, where it forms a, a sort of a, a gas plume. The second type of dispersion is um, what we call instantaneous releases. So these are unlike continuous releases, they're very short duration, um, less than a minute. So things like fireballs are, are always under 30 seconds generally when modeling them. Um, and they don't continue to be fed from a source. So they, they're just a, a instantaneous, like a classic, classic instantaneous release is a catastrophic rupture of a, of a vessel. Now, Obviously, in terms of likelihood, the continuous releases are generally more more likely, thankfully, than the than the instantaneous releases, because the instantaneous ones can would generally be worse in terms of their physical effects. So I'll talk a little bit about fires. Um, so generally, there are three types of fires: jet fires, pool fires, and flash fires. So I'll go ahead and play the jet fire there for you. You can see that on the left, the left hand side. So jet fire is basically a continuous leak or pressurized release from a vessel or a piping that holds, um, that holds um, uh, either mixed phase or, um, or uh, gas, gas phase substances. And it's generally characterized by an immediate ignition. Um, pool fires are generally low momentum releases. So they, develop over a horizontal surface and they're contained by the topography or the, the surroundings. So for example, in that picture in the middle, you can see um, a storage tank. So they're contained, so that fire there is, is contained, is a, is a fire of, a, of an adjacent tank and it's contained within a bund. I'll try and play the flash fires. So flash fires are otherwise known as cloud fires. They're, they're short lived and generally caused by ignition of a mixture of air and flammable liquid or gas. So you can see in the video there, the cloud forming, and the gradual dispersion. And there you go. So unlike jet fires, which ignite immediately in general, uh, flash fires happen where there's a delay before the ignition, um, where there's time for the flammable gas to mix with air. Um, and typically flash fires will occur in uncongested, unconfined areas, so open areas. Um, so generally the overpressure effects from a flash fire are not very significant. So most people that are harmed by a flash fire are harmed through the um, engulfment in the fire. So they're within the... Uh, the flammable gas air mixture. Vapor cloud explosions. So um, following on nicely from flash fires. So vapor cloud explosions are a result of a, a, a result of a delayed ignition. Again, a flammable gas air mixture with, but this time within a congested or a confined area. So unlike the fires that we discussed in the previous slide, um, the main physical effect from an explosion are overpressure, causing harm to people or damaging structures. Um, so the, the the plot there just shows you uh, shows you an example of overpressure overpressures generated from a, a physical effects modeling software. Um, Blevy or boiling liquid expanding vapor explosions. So blevies are generally, um, they always start with a catastrophic rupture of a vessel um, and typically a vessel that contains um, pressurized vapor or pressurized gas. 
you know, after the, the catastrophic rupture, or the catastrophic rupture is, is generally characterized by flame impingement. So um, generally it's a, it's a pull fire impinging on a, on a pressure vessel or um, a jet fire impinging on a, on, on a pressure vessel. Um, and then the vapor expands and you get a fireball. So smoke dispersion is another type of physical effect, um, obviously caused by incomplete combustion of hydrocarbon liquids. So because of the low supply or relatively low supply of oxygen to the fire, um, you get a lot of um, toxic, com toxic combustion products. So uh, for example, carbon monoxide, and these impair visibility and they can potentially prevent safe escape from uh, narrow areas like offshore installations. Oil spills. So oil spills are generally, generally from offshore installations, offshore oil installations, but also oil tankers. And they're also a type of physical effects modeling. So their effects are mainly, mainly environmental, but they can also, they can also lead to a, a sea surface pool fire, as you can see on that picture on the left. Okay, so physical effects modeling um, stages are threefold. So the first stage being, it always starts with a, with a discharge, with a source term. So it has the substance contained and then there's a loss of containment and that's where we start that's where our physical effects modeling starts um, then the second stage is is to actually do the, the the modeling of the effects after the after the initial release so you've got the different types of physical effects that you that you model following on from a from a from the discharge and then after you get your physical effects results or your uh, your, your distances to different uh, effect levels, you then use that to determine uh, vulnerability. Uh, you generally link it to the probability of a fatality or numbers of fatalities if you have the information on people presence. Um, and then for equipment, it'll be things like property damage and potentially environmental effects as well. So it's very important to note that um, because we're modeling, we're trying to simulate reality. We're trying to simulate something that, that could potentially happen in real life. So we generally don't have all the input data for modeling, um, or at least we, you know, there's things that are variable like weather, weather conditions vary all the time. So it's really about selecting representative input data to go into your model. And it's very normal to include a set of assumptions um, and as part of good practice, we generally try to have an, an assumptions register, which um, which gives you the, the the rule sets and and the underlying assumptions of, of the modeling, um, and then that way the modeling can be um, scrutinized and it can also be replicated if need be in the future. So another another flowchart, another schematic here. This time I'm just trying to break down, give you an overview of, of the different types of physical effects modeling and, and, and how they evolve. So again, we, we're starting with a source term, with a material in containment and then loss of containment. Okay, so the questions we, that are asked uh, when we're looking at the source term, we look at the material that, that's going to be released, um, its conditions before release, um, the mass flow rate upon release, and over time, and the area um, and the velocity of the release. Um, so generally what happens next is characterized by um, if there is ignition and how quickly the ignition occurs. So if there is no ignition, then we would get dispersion. If there's an immediate ignition, then generally we'll get uh, a fire, a jet fire or a pool fire. Um, and if there's a delayed ignition, then it would either be a flash fire or an explosion. Now, if the substance is toxic, then we're very interested in, in, in dispersion because if, it, if it's, for example, a flammable and toxic substance like hydrogen sulfide, um, the worst physical effects may be from dispersing and not igniting 
over long distances rather than immediately igniting or, or having a delayed ignition. Um, for immediate ignition, we're really looking at radiation, but also we may look at smoke as well. And for delayed ignition, um, depending on the geometry, depending on the surroundings, if it's a highly congested area, it would be a, or a confined area, it would be an explosion, a vapor cloud explosion. And if it's an open area, then it would generally be a flash fire. And the, the effects that we're interested in from, from the flash fire is obviously the flame engulfment, as, as we mentioned earlier. And from explosions, it will be the overpressure. So as a result, so once, once we establish these effects, toxicity, radiation, maybe smoke, flame engulfment, overpressure, we then link these to um, different vulnerabilities. So vulnerability of people, vulnerability of assets, so equipment, structures, things like that, and on the environment. So the key learning points of that section of the webinar is, is that physical effects result in potential harm to people, assets, and the environment. They always start with the release of a hazardous substance. The types of physical effects include gas dispersion, fires, boiling liquid ev evaporating, uh, expanding vapor explosions, smoke dispersion, and oil spill dispersion. So the stages, the stages of physical effects modeling begin with discharge, and then they're followed through with the extent of the physical effects, calculating the extent um, and the distances to which that reached, and an analysis of vulnerability. Okay, I'll now talk about the next section. I'll, I'll go into the next section of the webinar, which is the tools and techniques that are available to us to conduct the physical effects modeling. So there are various tools and techniques that are available to us. Um, they range from you know, simple, simple equations um, in a spreadsheet to software logarithms based on physics, and then they're correlated against experimental data as well. So the most sophisticated models would be the software tools that use, uh, that, that, that include uh, the 3D uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamic simulations, and the, the image on the bottom right there is just a, um, an example of, um, of the output of an empirical uh, software, software simulation. So this slide here just shows you the examples or several examples of, um, of software that can be used um, on the left, there's less. Re it's less resource intensive, so the empir empirical models are on the left side, um, but they're also potentially less accurate. And then, as you go more towards the right, it becomes um, more rigorous, uh, more resource intense, but potentially more accurate as well. So it's all about selecting the right tool for your application. So empirical models, they're widely, more widely used, uh, obviously easier to use, um, and they can be used for screening, for screening before doing more rigorous analysis, um, or they can form input to things like quantitative risk analysis. CFD tools and phenomenological tools are more complex, and they involve empirical correlations. Um, and with CFD, it would involve taking into consideration the, the 3D, the geometry of a facility to, to really look at dispersion, explosion behaviors in detail. So for source term modeling, we would look to determine the release rates, of course. That's what we're trying to do. Um, now, we can do that through simple spreadsheets with, uh, with formulae. And these are generally sufficient for most onshore environments. Um, however, for some onshore environments, we may want to use software. Uh, and certainly for, for, for the offshore environments or more complex facilities. Um, and these software are typically empirical, using empirical techniques. And they're generally they generally give you an output similar to that graph that you can see on the screen. So you can see that they also, the advantage is that they also give you um, the release rate over a duration of time. 
and typically there's that peak at the beginning when we with the initial release and then as the pressure drops off inside inside the vessel or inside the release source the release rate goes down over time so i'll just touch on the different types of models that are available for the different physical effects so for dispersion really the, the, what what the model what all models try to do is 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 predict a cloud size but also the cloud shape and concentration of flammable gas in air so it, it sometimes can provide a link between the input data to dispersion which is the source term modeling getting the release rate and flash fires and explosion modeling Um, of course, it's also it's also important for toxic dispersion, for toxic exposure, and estimating exposure of on or off-site populations. So generally, there's two ways to to model dispersion. There's sort of box models, which calculate vapor cloud dimensions and concentrations from the bulk properties, and there's CFD models, which divide the computational do domain representing the space through which the fluid disperses. So for thermal radiation, again, the accuracy of the model that you choose really depends on, on the application, but it always starts with calculating the flame dimensions and also the orientation of the flame. And then from there, the model, you have like a sort of a, a a model within a model so the second model would then use that flame data as input to estimate the thermal radiation so again the empirical modeling tools are, are generally what what are used for, for most facilities but in, in some cases there may be more complexity and CFD models may be used to determine loading on critical areas of structures and plants mainly so for explosions, there's a very wide variety of, of tools and they vary widely in complexity and um, resource intensity. But the general rule is when you've got an, gen, typically a sort of open geometry, um, some areas of congestion and confinement, of course, that, that's why we're modeling explosions. So that's why we think explosions are credible, but not enough to warrant um, the more complex tools then uh, simple correlation models, spreadsheets, or empirical models using software can be used. Now, for more complex geometries um, where there's more challenges, more risk management challenges, then the CFD, CFD models are more appropriate. So the key learning points from, from this section of the webinar is that there are a number of tools obviously available to us, and they range from simple spreadsheets all the way to very, very fancy software. Um, the most sophisticated tools can be very resource intense, but they can also give us more accurate results. The complexity of the tools should really be proportionate to, to your challenges, to the, to the level of risk that you, that, you, that you perceive that you're facing. And it's always good to be aware that there are sometimes hidden data built into software. So it's very important to just um, be aware of that and, and recognize the software as a tool uh, rather than uh, as, as like um, a black box that will just, um, you know, you, give, you put something in and it gives you, give you the results that you want. No, it's, it's, um, it's just a tool that you use um, that you at times even manipulate in order to get uh, results that are representative of of the situation that you're trying to analyze so it's very important always to give the results a reality check you know ask yourself are they plausible and um, that's always the first the first stage of a review of physical effects modeling results um, you look at the distances to the different levels of harm you look at the uh, the effects that that, that that the modeling has given you and and you make a judgment is this what I expect? And that comes, of course, with experience. 
So on to the next section of the webinar, human vulnerabilities. So I've chosen to focus on human vulnerabilities um, as opposed to um, asset and environment. Um, so the air, as the slide shows, the areas that we're going to be focusing on are um, diff different radiation, uh, ways of calculating the radiation, physical effects, um, toxicity, and overpressures. I'll also include fl flame engulfment when I'm talking about fires. So in this slide, you can see some examples of, of some out, uh, contours that are typically, um, typically um, the output of um, specialist software. So the one on the left is, um, is an example of, um, of a jet fire release. From a, from a pressure vessel containing flammable gas. And you can see that the plot here gives you distances or contours cor uh, representing different radiation levels. And on the right, you can see um, overpressures uh, on, the, on, the, on the Y axis um, and distance on the, on the X axis. And you've got the overpressures uh, dropping off as, as the distance increases from the source from the source of congestion because explosions always start from the source of congestion rather than the, from the release source so so in the previous slide these are these are physical effect levels um, at time zero so you get a release rate you get the initial release rate you then use that to calculate your for example, on the left, the left side image is, is the contours for thermal radiation, or pressurized release, and on the right, it's overpressures from, from an LPG explosion. So in some cases, especially when it comes to things like toxic exposure, um, but also radiation, um, we use things called probit functions. So instead of looking at um, an exposure level or, or an effect level. Um, we also combine that with time, time of exposure. So it's a it's a it's like a, a dosage. So so they probit functions can then be related to um, fatality probabilities. And underlying these different probit functions are historical and experimental experience. So th th these historical and experimental experiences are used to develop different probit equations. And then uh, they're linked to fatality probabilities. So here's some famous examples of fires. So on the left there is the Deepwater Horizon. Of course, that led to 11 fatalities and significant environmental effects. And then Ras Lanouf in Libya, that's the most recent one. That was obviously caused by um, um, third party, um, so a, a criminal attack. And then the one at the bottom is Texas City, which is the, the refinery where there was a, initially an explosion, but then there were also subsequent fires as well as a result. Okay, so human vulnerability to fire. So this table just gives you a quick snapshot of different fire types and um, the different effects um, and, and, or the different um, vulnerabilities, sorry, from these effects. So for flash fires, you can see there that um, if a person is engulfed in the fire, then yes, they will be, they will, they will be a, a highly vulnerable to the fire. Um, however, with radiation, because typically the radiation generated is uh, negligible, then it's a no for human vulnerability. Inside a building, um, I put there possibly because um, unless, so if someone is inside the building and, it, and they're completely sealed sealed off from from the from the flash fire, then then it would be a no. However, if there is a potential for flammable gas ing ingress into the building, then they would certainly be vulnerable vulnerable to that flash fire. Jet fires, so it's yes, yes, yes. So engulfed in a jet fire, of course, that's a, a pressurized uh, jet um, uh, 
touching you or, or you're, you're engulfed in that, then yes, you, you would be vulnerable to that, obviously. Radiation from, from a jet fire, yep, so radiation could extend potentially for um, large distances. And for if you're inside a building, depending on what building, of course, but inside a normal building, then yes, you, you would potentially be vulnerable. You would, the building would not offer you enough protection there. And for pool fires, it's the same. Of course, there's just less momentum behind the pool fire. So potentially in, engulfment, engulfment is, is less, is a lot less likely. Um, but radiation, certainly yes. And inside the building also, yes. For fireballs and blevies, so um, engulfment and radiation, certainly yes. If you're right next to a fireball, you, you're highly vulnerable. If you are, uh, the radiation that it generates, uh, although short-lived, it's very intense. So yes, for radiation. Inside the building, however, um, well, um, blevies do generate overpressures, but um, because the radiation is generally short-lived, um, if you're in a, 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 a building of, of decent construction and you're not in the, in the line of sight, then you may not be affected by, by the blevy. However, if you are inside a building and if you are inside a building um, and it, it, you, you do have line of sight to, to the blevy, then obviously you would not you would be vulnerable, so you know, possibly for that. So I'll talk a little bit about thermal radiation. So it, it's really, a, thermal radiation is measured in kilowatts per meter squared. Um, so the kilowatts per meter squared thermal radiation uh, is, is linked to probabilities of fatality. Um, and normally at, at, when we're not looking at time varying releases, we directly link the thermal radiation level in kilowatts per meter squared to the percentage probability using lookup tables, like the one shown here. So this is taken from the OGP risk assessment data directory. Um, so as you can see, there's when you get to 37 and a half and above kilowatts per meter squared, um, the modeling, in, in, when we're looking at vulnerability from, from the modeling results, we say it's 100% fatality. We normally assign it a 100% fatality um, probability. However, with 12 and a half, that's kind of the threshold for um, potentially 70% um, fatality uh, as per this source. If, you're, if a person is outdoors and if they're indoor, um, they, there could be, there, there would be some protection offered by the building at that moderate radiation level of 12 and a half kilowatts per meter squared. So it's assigned 30%. Now, thermal dose units. Um, so earlier we spoke about probit equation. So this is an example of prob a probit function or probit equation. Um, and the thermal dose unit really is, um, is, is looking at the radiation, the thermal radiation or the, or the radiation flux, uh, linking that with exposure duration. So some examples are, are there at the bottom of the slide. Um, a thousand thermal dose unit represents 1% um, fatality according to the UK HSC criteria, 1,850% fatality, and 3,200, 100% fatality. So the value of that is that we, we're looking at exposure time as well as the thermal radiation level to, to help us make um, better conclusions about human vulnerability. Okay, so for explosions, these are some examples of famous explosions that have occurred. So you can see, still got Texas City in there at the, at the bottom, which was also in, in fires. It was a very violent explosion that resulted in um, many fatalities. So for overpressures um, from explosions, it's, it's important to distinguish between, when we're looking at human vulnerability from them, it's important to distinguish between um, people indoors and people outdoors. So for people outdoors, we generally, we can generally make assumptions about um, 
that they would be in general they, they could potentially be just as vulnerable or more vulnerable to people in indoors in unprotected buildings however to understand it it's we should categorize the different the different effects on humans from overpressure so the primary effect is the, the injury to the body as a result of the pressure change of course the, the, the overpressure directly from the overpressure a secondary effect is a result of fragments and, and debris or missiles produced from the overpressure impacting a human and thirdly the injury is as a result of the human body especially the head being thrown by the explosion drag and impacting on objects and structures so human vulnerability for explosions is very highly dependent on whether you're indoors whether you're outdoors and what type of building you're in if you are indoors so again these are just examples in the table taken from the same source uh, from OGP linking different overpressure levels to percentage fatalities or percentage um, fatality probabilities or lethality probabilities for people indoors and people near buildings so for indoors there's another dimension to to, to it where we, we where we have to look at the type of building that the people are in so we look at the construction material and the stability of the structure in an explosion as well as the overpressure generated from the explosion so on the graph there on the right you can see that there's from api 752 um, there it classes buildings into five categories depending on the material of construction and from these five categories we can then um, we can then distinguish between uh, the fatality probability um, to people in these buildings um, from the overpressures generated from the model. So generally people inside the building, when they are killed, it's due to the damage or the collapse of the building. So toxic impact. Um, so one of the most um, tragic accidents is the Bhopal accident when it comes to toxic exposure because unlike many industrial toxic exposure um, accidents um, this affected um, huge numbers of um, off-site off populations um, and to this very day there's still people suffering from the effects of that release there's, I highly recommend um, reading up on Bhopal because um, um, it shows you just how just how bad it can get when, when when we get it wrong when we fail to manage our risks so an example of uh, of a toxic substance is hydrogen sulfide so we, we, we encounter that a lot in the oil and gas industry um, and from the physical effects modeling results we get concentrations in parts per million so that's parts per million of h2s in air um, and from from the from the different concentrations in air we can come up with um it can give us an idea of the potential health effects or or, or even worse uh, fatalities from the exposure and again i've used the same source for this table the ogp risk assessment directory so for toxic dose um unless you're making a quick decision um, or a very simple simple decision um, normally toxic dose is used over just getting um, uh, concentrations in air of toxic substances from an initial release now this is because of course um, exposure is very important when it comes to being able to ascertain um, the chance of a fatality or probability of a fatality so some examples of um, toxic dose criteria for, for H2S again uh, is the specific level of toxicity slot that the UK HSE have specified for so it's in, obviously in ppm minutes um, and that correlates to 1% fatality probability at that at that concentration minute concentration exposure over time 
and SLOD, which is the significant likelihood of death. And that number corresponds to 50% probability of fatality from H2S. Okay, so the key learning points of, for the human vulnerability section. Um, so really our, our hazards can be linked to, or that the hazardous effects can be linked to probability of human fatality or injury. Um, we can assess the vulnerability to the physical effects by looking at the exposure to a certain level of effect. So radiation or toxic exposure, for example, or it could be, or vulnerability could be determined on a dosage basis. So looking at the level of, effect, of the effect as well as the duration of exposure. So there are different ways of determining, determining human vulnerability. Some are more conservative than others. So obviously if we're looking at a, the, the initial release rate using that to, or the, the, the physical effects as a result of the initial release rate, then that'll, that'll be much more conservative than say using a, a probit function, which looks at toxic, uh, which looks at exposure over time. Yep. So that, that can be, so uh, in brackets there, you can see an example that I was just trying to um, draw your attention to. So. There's um, the IDLH and the ERPG criteria, which are um, which basically use um, toxic concentrations in air um, as indications of different effects for emergency response planning as well as um, occupational health from toxic gas exposure. Um, and you compare that against slots and slods, which we looked at in the previous slide, um, and you can see that. Um, slot and slot are much more, um, they're, they're, they're potentially less conservative because they're going to actually be looking at um, toxic exposure over time. So when we're looking at exposure over time, uh, in general with radiation, we're looking at seconds. And for toxic exposure, we're looking at minutes. That's something interesting to note. So this is the last part of the webinar, um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the real life uses and applications of physical effects modeling results. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples from my experience. So really what I'd like to highlight is that there's three or there are three ways that me as a, as a practitioner, uh, a risk management consultant that I use um, physical effects modeling results or where I do physical effects modeling. Um, the first being is, is when I just want to make, when, when for that specific scenario or application, I just want to make direct conclusions and I'm able to do that just simply by looking at, uh, by doing the physical effects modeling, taking the results, um, analyzing vulnerability to humans or vulnerability to assets or environment and then making a decision just purely based on that. The other use case is um, I use physical effects modeling as an initial screening tool to understand where more rigorous analysis is needed or, and, or if more rigorous, rigorous analysis is needed. Um, so this just helps focus a, a potentially, um, so it helps make a decision on whether we need Firstly, whether we actually need a more rigorous analysis or can I revert back to the first use case and just directly make conclusions and, and make decisions. Um, or um, it could help where you, you potentially have different levels of risk and you just want to understand where your highest priorities are, where to focus your rigorous analysis. Um, thirdly, the third use case I have for physical effects modeling results is combining them with frequencies and probabilities to quantify risk. And that's a type of rigorous analysis that, that I, was, I was pointing to. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk to you about, um, I've got three examples here where I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk you through each one um, and I'll explain how the physical effects modeling were results were carried out and and how the results were used and what were the final uh, what was the final outcome in, in in each project so the first project is 
the determining the sterile area around the flare stack uh, as part of the flare stack's design. And this is in a large gas processing plant, um, which has obviously flammable gas, but it also has high H2S concentration streams. So the use case here is, is identifying different flare modeling scenarios or flaring cases, combining these flaring cases with the different environmental conditions. And again, we're making assumptions on the different environmental conditions based on real life weather data. And then uh, looking at um, obviously the, 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 the normal case with, where we've got ignition of the flare and an upset or a, um, the unwanted loss of ignition or flame out at the flare stack. So combining all these different cases and, and scenarios together, um, the physical effects modeling uh, results were produced or generated. Um, so for each scenario, we had thermal radiation results, so in kilowatts per meter squared over distances, and we had um, the lower flammability limit concentration in air, so flammable gas concentration in air for the flame out scenario. Um, so the physical effects modeling was essentially used as a way to do sort of a sensitivity, uh, sensitivity analysis. Um, so we kept modeling the flame stack at different heights, so the different design options, until we found the height that gave us um, very little or no physical effects on the ground. Now, in some cases, we could only get the height tall enough to avoid um, really high, you know, the, the higher um, physical effects on the ground. Um, so it's normal sometimes where you get, for example, uh, still um, some higher radiation levels or unwanted radiation levels at ground level. And in that case, um, most uh, oil and gas plants will have will define a sterile area around the flare stack. Um, and these are just based on occupational health levels. So, for example, um, they can range from one to four kilowatts per meter squared. As, uh, for, as the example in, in thermal radiation. So this case was the challenge in, in this project was that they had high H2S streams. So when we looked at the flame out scenario, if the flare stack loses its flame, we, we, potentially, we potentially get um, H2S dispersion over long distances. And H2S of course is heavier than air. So it tends to disperse downwards until it mixes with air enough or there's enough turbulence in, in, um, in, the, in the H2S air mixture for it to finally dis disperse and, 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 be, uh, and be at negligible um, PPM levels. Okay, so this is an example of me making a direct, so directly making a decision or make, making recommendations to a client based on only the physical effects modeling results. Okay, so I'll give you another example here. So this is a facility siting study. Um, so it's a, a, it's a chemical plant where uh, it's, it's an aging plant. So it's a very old plant with um, lots of spacing constraints and uh, or, or suboptimal spacing, put it that way. Um, obviously being a, a chemical plant and, and especially being an old one, there, there's also a lot of congestion there. Um, so the objective really, I was tasked with carrying out a building risk assessment or a BRA. Uh, and, and the purpose of that BRA was really to inform the management of that plant on the decisions um, with respect to the acceptability of existing plant building locations. Um, they also wanted to look at temporary portable buildings that they, that they will introduce to the plant. Um, because of um, various projects and construction activities in the future. So that was an additional challenge as well that was presented to me. So as you can see on the right, um, so what, what was adopted there was, was kind of the old API 752 um, phased approach or, or, or staged approach to building risk um, or, or facility siting, uh, building risk assessment. 
first stage is a, a qualitative stage where we we list out all the buildings in the plant um, we then ask questions or maybe make criteria on occupancy so what constitutes an occupied building how occupied does it have to be for it to be an occupied building um, so typically um, if, if people are present there for a certain duration of time per day um, then that that takes it to the second stage where we where we want to analyze it for physical effects um, well, we can perform physical effects modeling and look at the results on that building. Um, similarly, with functionally significant buildings, so these are, these can be like, for example, emergency power generation, um, an emergency power generation building or, or, or an electric substation that's that's critical to um, to emergency power. So similarly, we would we would choose these buildings. We would we would screen them for further analysis and take them into stage two. So in stage two. We look at the physical effects modeling results for, for the buildings identified in stage one. We then see if we can draw conclusions directly from the physical effects modeling results. Um, and if we can't, then, um, or, or if we, um, so that, that'll, that'll help us identify um, buildings that are significantly impacted by the phys physical effects modeling results. Um, and then we can take them to stage three and combine the physical effects modeling results with probabilities and frequencies to get a quantitative risk profile for each building. So in this specific case, we found several buildings that were unoccupied and, and not, not really significant. Um, and they were easily just screened out in the first stage. In the second stage, we found several problematic buildings. Um, so buildings that were exposed to high levels of um, thermal radiation. But in this specific example, there was a lot of explosion overpressure due to the high levels of congestion at the plant. Um, we also found that um, high levels or high concentrations of flammable gas in air um, could form. So flammable gas clouds were, were forming around these problem buildings or problematic buildings. So for these problematic buildings, we, um, we took them to stage three and we performed a, a quantitative risk assessment or building risk assessment using a quantitative risk analysis. Um, so what were the results? So the results in this example was the relocation and upgrade of, of these problematic buildings. So some buildings were relocated. Uh, for example, there was a maintenance building that was exposed to high um, radiation and overpressure levels. So that was just relocated with relative ease. Um, the control room, however, could not be relocated uh, very easily. So instead, uh, this company chose to upgrade the control room um, to have it more blast resistant as well as installing flammable gas detection, which are automatically linked to the HVAC inlet, and that shut down the HVAC dampers upon detection of flammable gas to prevent, prevent ingress. So I'm told that the, this, this, this organization, this chemical plant um, is also, is still, is still using uh, the, um, the building risk assessment or the facility siting study that, that we did um, to help them make decisions for um, when, when they introduce uh, temporary portable buildings at the site. So they, when, when, they're, when they're introducing um, these portable buildings, they make sure that they're outside, um, outside certain physical effect and risk contours as per the study. So I'll give you one more example. Um, so this example um, is probably um, is, is very challenging. I, find, I found it very, I mean, you can see from the image on the right, um, the amount of encroachment there. So it's an LPG storage and distribution facility in the Middle East. Um, and you can see some of the houses, they just go right up, right up close to the, uh, to the loading bay there, the LPG loading bay. And they're not too far from the, um, from the spheres as well, from the from the LPG spheres. Um, so that that's really the challenge presented. So there there are um, a large 
LPG storage and distribution facility. They've got large LPG spheres or, or large capacity LPG spheres and lots of encroachment by the residential areas. So this particular company were facing pressure from both the safety regulator as well as the, the energy re regulator. So the safety regulator wanted them to do something about this encroachment and they were not happy that, um, that there was such encroachment near the facility, of course. Um, uh, I, I was told that the uh, residential buildings there were illegal housing. Um, nevertheless, the safety regulator wanted something done very quickly. The energy regulator <laughs> wanted them to increase their storage capacity um, and increase the amount of uh, uh, loading facilities as well so that they can meet the energy, the growing energy demands of, of that country. So they were really um, stuck between two, uh, yeah, so you can see the pressure both ways on them. So they wanted a, a really comprehensive study um, to, uh, to help them make decisions, uh, uh, changes to the plant, modifi future modifications. Um, so as part of the pressure that the safety regulator was exerting, they decided to choose to use um, a, a risk-based approach or, or a combination of physical effects and risk-based approach for land use planning. So they adopted the UK HSE, HSE LUP criteria. So the UK HSE LUP criteria is, is basically um, around major hazard installations is, is, to, is to define consultation distances. So there's a, a different zones. So an, in, an inner zone, a middle zone, and an outer zone. So each zone has certain restrictions on land use. Um, so depending on the sensitivity of the population or, or the development in each zone. Um, so uh, so de de depending on the um, sensitivity of the population and the type of development, they're restricted or they're unrestricted in the various zones. And of course, outside the inner zone, there's no, no restrictions apply. So the LUP criteria that were adopted, the UK HSE criteria, um, have uh, both physical effects, uh, physical effects criteria in the form of a what they call a protection-based analysis. And they also have a quantified risk criteria in the form of location-specific individual risk. So, of course, the protection-based analysis criteria is just um, directly based on the physical effects that, that were modeled. So we model the kilowatts per meter squared uh, as a result of the, um, the so the thermal radiation from from the LPG storage facilities or equipment, um, and and that's done through the thermal dose unit. So it's done like a a, a probe it so through a probe it um, equation, um, and obviously the so the regulator chose this because um, for fireballs they typically they're short lived, um, and they can generate huge amounts of radiation over long distances. So having the, the probe equation being used there, um, we're looking at um, exposure in seconds. And that's very appropriate for, your, for a fireball, which typically lasts for less than 30 seconds. So its effects are completely gone after 30 seconds. So doing it by, by second allows them, to, allows the, the, or using that dose unit approach um, uh, it, it's quite good for, for, for specifically for um, uh, facilities that, are, uh, that have the potential to generate um, uh, fireballs like uh, LPG storage facilities, like in this case. Um, quantitative risk criteria were also adopted. So we, we, we did both from the outset. We, did, we, 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 we knew, so the, the, the study was comprehensive such that we used both the protection-based analysis and the quantified risk profile um, and we made different uh, we made conclusions based on both based on both uh, both types of, uh, of of analysis. So for location specific individual risk, very quickly, this is um, this took into consideration not only the physical effects uh, physical effect modeling results, um, but it also combined them with uh, failure frequency of equipment, uh, with um, probabilities of different weather conditions based on um, the actual weather conditions measured at that site um, with ignition probabilities um, to, to give you 
uh, location specific individual risk, which is uh, the units for that uh, uh, fatalities per year. So in the end, um, so the, the, the image is there that you can see, uh, obviously a protection based analysis versus quantified risk criteria, LSIR contours. And you can see that they're fairly similar. You know, they're, they're, they're fairly similar. You can see that the, the LSIR contours are a little bit differently shaped. And that's because they also consider um, releases from piping and things like that, like the, the LPG loading bay and the filling holes for the cylinders whereas the protection-based method is just looking at the storage spheres. Just, it's just looking at the fireball scenario. So the results of the, of the study were twofold. So we made short-term mitigations. Um, so these are the recommendations I made to them. Um, as a short-term mitigation, um, create an integrated off-site emergency response plan and have a kind of sort of public awareness campaign. Um, and that can, that, because that can be done relatively quickly and it can just act as a, as a just as a short term, just as a mitigation while we develop longer term solutions. So, so for longer term solutions, um, the, the recommendations were to have mounded bullet tanks to replace the LPG spheres. Um, so the mounded bullet tanks that, that, that this, that, that the client, um, uh, purchased uh, even bigger capacity than the LPG spheres. So it allowed them to meet the increased LPG demand. Um, that, that was the pressure from the energy regulator. While at the same time, they uh, prevented or they, they removed um, a um, the fireball risk um, from the Blevy from the Blevy situation, because of course, having the, the bullet, bullet tanks mounted um, in concrete or, or in, um, um, or, or, or in a big mound would would mean that um, there are no there is no potential for um, impingement by things like jet fires, and therefore um, we remove the blevy risk. Um, another recommendation was to relocate a portion of the population. Um, so there, there's still risk there. There's still population in the inner zone even after we performed the sensitivity analysis to look at mounding. Uh, mounted bullet tanks. So you relocated populations so that the population density um, is in compliance with the UK HSC LUP criteria. And that was done uh, in collaboration, of course, with government authority. Third long-term solution was that um, was that we, we found some some like mini blevies, so sm smaller blevy scenarios when we were doing the, the quantitative risk analysis from the um, steel cylinders that are uh, kept at the yard. So in, in, uh, in, some, in some cases, the yard is, has up to a thousand cylinders um, and uh, a portion of them are full, full of LPG, waiting to be transported by truck to the, to the users. So, um, so uh, uh, they, they, th this company adopted some good practice or some best practice uh, in that they replaced the steel cylinders with composite cylinders in the storage yard, which reduces obviously the, the contribution um, the contribution from Blevy. So um, this, is, this is something I, I did, this study is, is quite recent. So it's actually um, still being used today um, to make decisions on um, land use planning. Um, and um, I, I've been told that they intend to keep updating the, the, the QRA um, or the, the LUP study um, to still make it relevant to all the changes that they're making and so that it remains um, relevant for future decision making as well. Okay, so the key takeaways from that is that we have a variety of different physical effects modeling that can be used in, and they can be used to make important real life decisions. So they can either be used direct to make direct decisions um, based on, only on the harm criteria that we compare the physical effect modeling results to, such as the example I gave with the uh, flare stack design. They can also be used as a, as a screening tool um, to focus a more rigorous analysis on higher priority risk items, like the example I gave for the facility siting study or the building risk assessment. And 
they can be used as input to a more rigorous analysis, um, such as the example I gave, the last example I gave in the QRA, um, to help inform decisions. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, just give you a quick summary of my of my webinar. So physical effects are releases of hazardous fluids and they have the potential to result in harm to people, assets and environment. Of course, I focus the, the webinar on, on the harm to people. So type of physical effects, they include flamble, flamble or toxic gas dispersion, different types of fire, blevy or fireballs, smoke dispersion and oil spill dispersion. The stages of physical effects always begin with the release of the hazardous substance, a discharge. So we model that discharge and then following on from that, we model the extent of the different physical effects. And then we analyze vulnerability, so vulnerability to people, asset or the environment. So we have a number of different ways or tools and techniques that are available to us. Um, they range from simple spreadsheets all the way to uh, complex CFD modeling and it's really about choosing the right tool for the right situation so it should really be proportionate the tool that you choose should be proportionate to, uh, to the magnitude of risk um, you know there's always a limited in, in, in all companies there's a limited um, limited resources and these resources should be put to best use and physical effects modeling is a great way to help to help do that but the the, the tool must be proportionate to the challenge that you're facing. The outcome of the physical effects modeling, so the results are linked to probabilities of fatality. And I focus the webinar on human vulnerability, um, and that can be assessed either uh, based solely on the exposure level or the exposure to the level of harm, or it can include the duration of exposure, so on a dosage basis. I gave some real life examples of, of, of using physical effect modeling results. Um, and how they directly informed decisions um, and how they were used as a screening tool, as well as how they were used as input to more rigorous analysis. Over to, to Steve for any questions. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Abdul Rahman. Um, yeah, but apologies, we seem to, the slide seems to have got frozen at the end there. So we didn't pick up the last few sides, but um, no worries. Uh, we, we, we've got a number of questions in. We've actually kind of overstayed our welcome quite a bit. So uh, what I'll do <laughs> is I'll just cherry pick some of the questions. Um, and if I could ask you, uh, Abdul Rahman, for some pretty short responses, that would be sure. great. And then we'll get wrapped up. Um, a, a question from Hardeep. Um, could you say a little bit more about the conditions necessary for a fireball? Yeah, so so um, conditions really necessary for a fireball um, and actual input data to the model are, are the uh, um, the properties of the hazardous substance. So um, what type of substance you have under containment, um, the conditions at which it's stored, um, and the catastrophic rupture um, scenario of the of the vessel. So, um, for example, if it's a blevy, then it would need uh, something to initiate that catastrophic rupture, um, so which would typically be a jet fire or a pool fire, and if it's a um, if it's a, a catastrophic rupture for another reason, like for example an overpressurization, um, then so so really it's about establishing um, the conditions at which the hazardous substance that is stored, the actual hazardous substance properties, and the failure mode of the uh, containing containing vessel or the. Okay, thanks. A uh, question from Matthew. Um, would you be correct in thinking that uh, all of these physical effects would be contained in a, in a, a MAP, M-A-P-P, which I think is a UK term. I think it's a major accident prevention plan, uh, including the calculations for glass cloud and dispersion. Um, I, I believe so. Um, I haven't. I'm, I am a bit out of practice. So I've, I've been in, in Dubai and, and, and the Middle East for, for, for seven years now. So I am... I, I, I don't know. Do, do, do you know, Steve, that they, they I, I think all the, of them, or the, the latest version of MAP? Yeah, I think the expectation is that, that, that um, all the physical effects that could potentially result in a major accident were, would be expected to be included in such a plan. Um, yeah, so I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Um, yeah, a question, good question from Michael. Um, what's your view on the accuracy of uh, sort of consequence modeling? You know, he says, I've seen people quoting, for example, 12.3456. Yeah. <laughs> and he's actually suggest in this case, perhaps the answer is somewhere between 11 and 14. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no. So I, I I completely agree with with what Matthew's like pointing towards there. I mean, when I'm reviewing, so as I've developed more experience in this field or in this one of my areas of my specialism, I I, I look at sort of younger engineers' reports and and I see you know all the, the three or four decimal places when when they look at um, a thermal um, a distance to a certain thermal radiation level, for example, um, and I always ask them to um, to have it to no decimal places, especially when it comes to distances in meters. So, and likewise, if 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 if, if the results are giving us ten meters, you know, and 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 we've got a receptor at eleven meters, then you know we shouldn't we shouldn't say oh yeah we're okay we're a meter away so so we don't have to do anything. No, we, we should, you know, um, we, we, we have to obviously, and, and we do that more so, uh, also we look at the type of tool that we've used, if it's a, a, it's a more simplistic tool, then, then we would, uh, of course, um, be more um, mindful of that when making, conclu drawing conclusions and making recommendations, and if it's a more accurate result. But funnily enough, there was, there was a, an example recently where um, for, for a specific project, uh, CFD modeling was carried out, as well as a more simplistic empirical model, and for, for, for some of the, um, the, the the thermal radiation dispersion results, they were so similar. So so that it goes to show you that, you know, you don't necessarily have to always choose the more complex, um, more rigorous yeah. analysis, but yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, great. A uh, question from Yanis. Um, you recognize obviously using any of the software models requires expertise and, uh, and, and uh, sort of experience. Um, but do you think a, a, a user of a CFD software model, um, do you think it'd be an asset to have some kind of uh, educational professional certification? Yeah, I, I mean, j just like with all the other, um, so I, I think even with the empirical kind of modeling software uh, and phen phenological um, modeling software as well, it, it, it would be it's certainly useful to have a certificate and undertake training. Um, um, however, um, really what I find, especially with, especially with physical effects modeling, um, it, it, you know, whether it's CFD or otherwise, it, is that um, experience really trumps any certificate. So, um, especially with uh, with more mature companies that are looking, for example, to select, um, for example, say consultants that are going to be working with them uh, on on these type of studies, um, we find that the more mature companies they 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 would never ask for a certificate, you know, um, because they they know that, um, oh, sorry, not never, but they would rarely ask for a certificate because they know that the certificate is not really a measure of competence. Um, and it's not a measure of, uh, of of the quality that they're going to get. So I, I would say that certainly training is is good, especially if you're in a beginner to intermediate stage. But once you once you kind of develop several years of experience under your belt and and you you, you get really hands on with the software, then the certificate just becomes um, more of a nice to have than a, than an essential um, kind of competence measure measure. So, yeah. Okay, a uh, question from Hardeep. Uh, in the example of the LPG um, study, so I think that was probably the land use planning one, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. And sort of smaller gas cylinders. Were, were missile effects considered in the QRA results? Uh, I believe they were, but um, so so we did use so it, when we when we correlated the fatality probabilities to the uh, thermal radiation. Uh, effects. We we also added a factor in there for for missile, uh, for impact of by missile uh, missiles from the um, from the cylinders. Um, and we were and and, and you know we, we were you know when 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 you're even when you're experienced, you do find sometimes that oh I didn't I wasn't expecting that distance. Oh, that's quite quite long. Or oh oh this wasn't as bad as I thought. So so in this particular example, we weren't expecting such bad results or, or severe results from from the cylinders. But then it made sense, although they had they all had very small um, failure frequencies, and there were so many of them stacked on top of each other, um, and, and up to a thousand, I think, in that storage yard, that the um, uh, that yeah that that they were significant, and um, and and therefore that recommendation was made to uh, to use a different type of cylinders to um, reduce that potential. 
Okay, and I think this is a, a related question from Bill, where he says, assuming he's understood what, what you've said, Abdul Rahman, uh, why doesn't a mounded bullet suffer from the risk of jet fire? Okay, so so um, it, this is a, there is a kind of the devil's in the detail with the mounding, but if if the mounding is so, there, are, there the, the mounding design that was used in this specific example was um, very thick concrete. Um, where there is no piping except just the, the, the connections to the, to, the, to the bullets and the bullets themselves inside the mound. So it would be very difficult for a jet fire from, from, you know, LPG, from the surrounding LPG piping to impinge, well, it would be almost impossible. I mean, it would have to, if it does impinge on the concrete, then the concrete is so thick that it would never, it would never go through. However, we have done other studies with mounted uh, LPG storage uh, vessels, um, where the mounding, the type of mounding is just earth mounding, and in some in some cases it's not very thick. Um, uh, so in that case, what we do is we we um, we sometimes use a, um, a combination of engineering judgment and uh, industry references to um, to reduce the uh, the blevy potential. To, to, to have like a conditional modifier to take credit for that earth mounding. However, for, for that specific type of mounding for that project, um, it was very interesting actually. They, the, 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 the bullets were, were, were both um, amazing because they were big and they were amazing because they were so well mounted. So on that basis, we dismissed the potential for um, flame impingement on, on the mounted bullets. Okay, great. Just so this Sorry, just, just th th three more questions then, and um, then we'll wrap up. A uh, question from Alex. Um, is there any legislation, legislation or standard that actually specifies the requirement to do physical effects studies, or is it just a company procedure? Yeah, so, so um, there are uh, legislation that either directly or indirectly uh, uh, stipulate um, uh, physical effects modeling. So, for example, um, We'll go to the UK. So in the UK, we've got the um, the UK HSE uh, safety case regulations, and I believe they don't actually say physical effects modelling anywhere in in the regulations. But when you look at the guidance to the regulations, there's some indirect references to um, you know things like QRA, um, which um, which would mean that you would need to do physical effects modelling to do a QRA. Um, so the example that I gave for the LPG storage facility, the UK HSE LUP criteria, so that, that they specifically, for, the, for defining the consultation distances, um, they, 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 um, they do use, um, so it is, it is a regulatory requirement to, um, to assess LUP. Now, whether it's a requirement to, to use physical effects modelling, that's, um, that really does depend on the applicant. That's a case by case thing. So specifically for LPG, I contacted the UK HSE for that, for that study. Um, and I asked for, for some advice on if they had a QRA and the thermal dose unit, the physical effects protection based analysis, which one would they, would they choose over the other if one of them was showing you know, higher or lower uh, effects or risk? And, and they told me that they would, for, specifically for LPG storage, they would prefer using the protection-based analysis because in general, in, in their experience, that gives them, that's more conservative. So um, I don't know if, if that answers, yeah. sorry. It's a lo yeah. long answer, but, but yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, no, th thank you. A um, couple to go, question from Hardeep. Um, basically saying, if, if, if we do a flare radiation study, and we find that the t temperature at a receptor um, is above the black body temperature and the human touch limit. Um, what, what sort of recommendations might be coming out of such a study? Okay, so, so we, we typically when we're making recommendations, we, we look at the uh, hierarchy of controls. So we look at the uh, hierarchy of control, kind of upside down pyramid, if you're familiar with that process safety um, uh, concept. Um, so it, it, within that hierarchy of control, we always try and eliminate the, 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 the risk or, or, the, or the adverse effects, physical effects. Um, and then at the bottom of the hierarchy, the other extreme is, is PPE. So 
if if there is if there is thermal radiation coming from a from a flare um, and and exceeding the black body temperature of, of of a vessel, especially if that vessel contains flammable substances, then that then that that would warrant um, a, a, a recommendation. Um, if it's at the design stage where you've got a lot of room for maneuver, then simple, you would just relocate. You would either increase the the height of the flare stack so that it it would never have uh, these um, uh, these levels of radiation um, uh, touching or impacting the uh, the vessel uh, and if it's or the equipment item and if uh, uh, alternative you can move the equipment item out the way um, so that's if you've got a lot of room for and that's always the preferred uh, option if you've got less room for maneuver then um, then it, you would potentially um, be looking at things like um, uh, having um, uh, raising firstly raising awareness to, for staff that this that this is a, a hazardous area that it is a hazard there uh, and potentially having uh, physical protection so I've it, it's not common but I've, I've known that one company in Southeast Asia um, put up like kind of a like a firewall um, against a, a sensitive receptor um, in front of a sensitive receptor so that um, so that if there is uh, thermal radiation levels that are high, it would be um, the receptor would be protected. So, okay, thank you. Uh, a question from uh, Vasilios. Um, I think this was referring to the facility siting um, uh, case study that you went through uh, involving screening the plant buildings. Uh, so he's, he's he's wondering. So would a hazop or hazard process have been completed? So that you could identify the source of the sources of all the releases, and then you can then combine it with the um, the topography of the existing build, buildings. Oh, that's a good question. I, I actually, um, I, th I think I didn't touch on it in the presentation. So, it, or, or, I, or I may have, I, I may have touched on it in that I was saying it's very important to get your input data right, your assumptions right. Um, so this is part of that. So, so a really key input to the to the physical effects modeling, um, whether you're just doing physical effects modeling or you're going to do a more rigorous analysis like a, a QRA after it, it's very important to. Uh, so a good hazard is um, it, 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 it's it's critical. And, and when there isn't a hazard, we even do something like a desktop. We call it a desktop hazard. Um, just so that we haven't missed everything out. Um, typically, what you would do is you would uh, you would divide your piping and instrumentation diagrams into isolatable sections, um, and you would look at your different operating conditions, um, and they would they would form. Uh, and then in the hazard, um, what, the hazard can can be like a, an initial screening tool um, for then. Um, for, for then, uh, so it's both a screening tool uh, to, to focus on um, high risk areas when you're doing the physical effects modeling, uh, as well as um, a tool for ident uh, or a way of identifying uh, key input information. So, so yeah, so sorry, the, the short answer is yes, um, has, a HAZOP and a HAZARD are useful inputs to physical effects modeling. Um, the HAZOP may not be needed um, because um, Unless you are going to model, for example, uh, uh, over te over pressure or over temperature cases from the HAZOP uh, 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 using physical effects modeling, uh, if you were to do that, then then yes, yeah, certainly the HAZOP would be important. If you were going to use physical effects modeling just to make uh, simple decisions, or you're going to use that as input to a QRA, then a hazard would be would be enough. Okay, thanks, Abdul Rahman. Uh, I think we need to wrap up now. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we've we've used up all our time and then some. Um, yeah, so th thanks for um, the webinar. Um, very sort of passionate uh, presentation. Uh, what we will do is make a recording available uh, to everybody later this week. Um, and if you've got any questions from what you've heard today, then uh, feel free to email uh, Abdul Rahman directly or just get in contact. Um, with us via the website. If you go to the web website risktech.tv.com, you'll find lots of uh, question, uh, lots of uh, pages where you can just fill in the contact form, get in contact with us. Um, I mean, if if you if you're really into this stuff, um, then we do have a, a two day uh, course on uh, physical effects modeling. Uh, it's, it's a really good course, and obviously we can go into uh, you know a lot more detail than we've managed to do in a short space of time today. So again, just look on our website and uh, see if you're interested in that. It's actually a distance learning course, so uh, you can just sort of sign up and uh, do it in your own time. Uh, okay, so thank you, Abdul Rahman, once again. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your thanks. attention.
Uh, the next webinar is uh, a week today, so that's Wednesday, the 20th of April. It's back to our usual time of sort of 3 p.m. UK. And the topic is about bringing hydrogen to life, uh, which is really about the new hydrogen economy and uh, some of the risk and safety management challenges. So hopefully you can join us for that one too. Uh, in the meantime, please stay safe and stay secure. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.